Hey, everyone. Welcome again to another Supernatural Leadership Podcast episode. My name is Sean Gaby. Thank you so much for stopping by. Don't forget to rate, review, and share this with your friends if you are impacted in any way in your leadership. In whatever sphere you are leading in, please share this with other leaders. We hear so many amazing stories of how these episodes really impact their leadership. And so and also let us know how it's impacting uh, uh, impacting your leadership. We'd love to hear about it. Tag us on social media, DM us, let us know how we can continue to support uh, the supernatural affecting and impacting your leadership. Today, we have a very special guest with us, friend of mine. We've had him already several times on this podcast in the last several years. And we're gonna be talking about a little bit about his new book that he just wrote. And so before I bring him on, I'm going to read his bio. We have Sean Bowles based out of California on uh, uh, this episode today. And Sean is a TV and podcast host, an author, producer, and a Christian minister. He's been leading conversations in the church entertainment industry and in social justice that have helped believers connect their faith to culture in a transformative way. Sean's deeply connected yet humorous style of speaking, media hosting, and coaching through his unique expert perspective has brought him around the world to meet with churches, CEOs, entertainers, and world leaders. His areas of passion include developing Christianity that brings transformation, the intersection of Christianity and popular culture, business from a faith perspective, social justice through faith, and hearing God's voice with a focus on restoring dignity to biblical-based prophetic ministry he is the author of several best-selling books including translating god keys to heaven's economy breakthrough prophecies prayers and declarations and his latest book which we're talking about today encounters or it's called encounter sorry and sean is also a contributing journalist online for cbn news network and charisma news network sean balls welcome again to the podcast how you doing <laughs> that was a lot that was a mouthful that was so good fun. i'm so glad to be here it's an amazing bio though. I, you know, your bio is actually longer. I shortened it, but uh, no, you got a lot of amazing things. And for those of you that don't know Sean Bowles, if you uh, live under a rock and you don't know who Sean Bowles is, he has some amazing, amazing content out there on various platforms. Like you have tons of podcasts, don't you? You have like tons of, do. how many have, shows do you have on, on a podcast platform? I don't, I don't know. Maybe, maybe we have a 500 shows now. I don't know. A lot. 500 shows. <laughs> But you have different like themed shows, right? Like you have like yeah, you have well, ones about my heart business, was like with the prophetic. Like yeah. you can't learn the prophetic just by being taught it. You have to actually hear what it's like in someone's life. So we did like exploring the prophetic, which was how does God add His value to the prophetic in your everyday life? How does how is hearing His voice change the world around you? So it's just everyday people. And we did exploring the marketplace, which is like how has God spoken to you in the marketplace and in, in your career in a place where you have influence and how did that change you or the world around you as well and we're exploring the industry because i'm involved in the entertainment industry so those ones are really good then we just launched recently prophetic perspectives and it's like me talking about everyday news items and public culture events and processing spiritually biblically prophetically but also pastorally with the audience and it's doing really well like people really i think need somewhere to process some of the stuff like johnny depp and amber heard as well as what's happening and the border control process in America or whatever, like people want a place to hear spiritually so that we don't just go to a negative place or to kind of a, a critical, but bad, but pretend good place of like, Oh, it's all going to be okay. We actually have to talk through some of those things and pray through and like, look at what God's doing. Well, and I, I have always appreciated your approach to life in general. You're, you're very good at pulling wisdom and understanding out of complex situations. I, Remember the first time I met you, I think, and you were leading the church you founded, Expression 58, yeah. in uh, Glendale, California. And Glendale, right? It's Glendale. Yeah. Yeah. It was Hollywood and, at the time, but it moved to Glendale. Yeah. Yeah. And I just remember like you, you, you know, you having like a controversial approach to a lot of things, but the way <laughs> that you would explain your processes always were like, wow, these are like illuminating. Like you, you always mm -hmm. had an amazing way of explaining and bringing understanding to complex controversial topics and I always appreciated that about, that about you and for those of you that don't know Sean Bowles like he's also in my opinion one of the 
best storytellers. Like I so appreciate <laughs> your style. I'm long-winded. No. <laughs> yeah. But you just do an amazing job and like your memory for stories and details, just incredible. I remember Bob Jones was like that. He just had this amazing way, even if his stories were like out there and so parabolic, you had to be like a really intense spiritual interpreter to understand. He just had this amazing memory for details when it came to stories. And yeah. I feel like you, you, you have that. And I love listening to your stories and how they connect to making faith practical. This is a supernatural leadership podcast. We want to practical tools on how to live out the supernatural in the context of our leadership. But I want to dive into your new book encounter. I have one right here. That's see easy. It? I have there. a book. Beautiful encounter. It's, it's beautiful. like a brain tree on the front. It's beautiful. I was just razzing uh, Sean before the podcast of the hide and get my, my free amazing book <laughs> in the mail. Apparently he sent me some, I never got them, but uh, I'm excited. I haven't read it yet. I've heard many good things about it. Good reports from people that I know that have read it. And, um, you know, but before we dive into the book and I'll get you to kind of share a little bit about that in a second, can you just bring us into sort of an introduction into Sean Bowles and some of the first encounters that he had that really probably, I would say, contributed a lot to why you would write a book like this? Well, Sean Bowles, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the way you said that, I want to talk about myself in third person. You know, I grew up in the church and um, and I grew up around a lot of the supernatural stuff because we were in the vineyard during the Jesus People Movement. And so people were getting healed all the time. And I was just a little kid and watching people go through deliverance or healing and seeing someone that my parents would say, this person was like living on the streets and now they're, they have a job, you know, because of Jesus and going to retreats and mountain cabins where God was moving with youth or whatever, like all these things growing up. And so by the time I was a teenager, I remember like there was a disconnect from feeling like I could do that or be, even though I had seen God move in some powerful ways, but really feeling like that this was my faith of how God would move through my life. And versus this was a movement that just happened to a bunch of people and they were lucky and blessed. And so I, I was um, at school and I was at a public school and I wasn't, I didn't see the impact that we preached about at church in that school. And I remember just going, God, I need to see your reality for real, like in this school, if, if I'm going to follow you and really give my life to you, I know you're good. I know you're full of love, but if I'm really going to do something that has significance for you, I need to have significance in you. And so I started to really pray that I was, you know, 14 years old or 13 years old when this happened. So I was a little, I was, a, I was a kid and wow. I was sitting next to this girl um, on a bench. She was waiting to go to uh, waiting to go home on a, a school bus and I was late for a project. And so I was going on like a late bus they had there and we were waiting quite a while. The bus was late for some reason. And so she, she's sitting there, we started talking and I knew her at school. She was like 14, a little older than me, but still in the same grade. And, uh, and she was a foster kid. I didn't know that. And so we were talking about life and, and she just was really down. And I said, God, I can have all the conversations like this. Thank you that she opened her heart up to me even, but if you don't come in this conversation, if you don't give me revelation, if you don't show me who she is, if you don't show her who she is, then it's just another conversation. And I'm, wow. I'm, I'm don't want to just have a lot of conversations that don't lead anywhere that are, that seem meaningful, but aren't that powerful. And I got caught up into a vision and I could see, and now I realized I was 13. I was very underexposed to um, stuff like molestation or sexual abuse. I didn't, I wouldn't have known anything about that at 13. I wasn't even like sexually awakened at 13. I don't think, you know, it was just like totally, you know, girls, I, I like girls, but I didn't, you know, I didn't understand the whole thing yet. And, and so I was a late bloomer in that sense, you know, 13 years old. And so all of a sudden I'm like, can I ask you some questions? And I began to ask her almost like the woman of the well versus telling her wow. woman of the well, ask her some questions that brought out some stuff. And then I told her what God thought about her in those moments and who God was in those moments. And it was all true. And it wasn't my parents doing, it wasn't some evangelist at church. It was like me feeling the heart of God, seeing who she really was and seeing how the enemy had put marks against her so that she couldn't really be her authentic self. And I just went to war with it in those minutes and just like talked to her, spoke to her, spoken to her destiny. And by the time I was done, she gave her life to Jesus, wow. started coming to our youth group. I, I went to a high school youth group, even though I was in uh, junior high, started coming to youth group because she was going to ninth or yeah, not going to ninth grade. And it just had a transformation and got set permanently in a home a family and became a different person all within like six months. Wow. And I remember just like walking away from after she got saved in that moment, I'd never brought some of the Lord before out, out and about. And we're just going, you're so beautiful, Jesus. You're so good. Like you just like undid a lifetime of pain in her life. This is so crazy. Wow. 
And I was wrecked in my heart, not just because it was an evangelism moment, but it was because I touched the thoughts and the perceptions of God in a way that I knew she was in therapy and she'd been in foster care and worked with social workers, but it wasn't helping her. I mean, I'm sure I was wow. doing some help, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in that moment, a 13 year old who didn't know anything about her life and yep. comes from a privileged place of having two parents and the whole thing, it changed her life. And so I just, it really, it didn't connect me. I, I always did evangelism, but it wasn't about, like I said, prophetic evangelism. It was about the perceptions of God and the revelation of his mind and heart was inside of me. And I just wanted that all the time. That's amazing. So you know, when, when you started encountering God, would you say that the encounters mostly happened in sort of a marketplace situation or no, it was interesting start as, personally, like privately? It was very personal because I was asking God about my life and he started to confirm things through just the world around me about my calling and what I was, you know, like favor was a big theme when I was in high school and there was a war. There's always like jealous people, even teachers in my life, which was so bizarre to me because I was like, you have a position, you have, you know, you, you have a career, I'm just a kid, you know, but there was like this, this jealousy thing, but there's also favor and God would lead me. And all of a sudden I would recognize like this drama teacher came up to me. I'd only been in her class for six months. She'd had some favorites. She was a extreme militant lesbian, totally knew I was a Christian. And I was very religious. So I wasn't nice about some of the stuff I would say just because I was, you know, going to a Baptist youth group at the same time I was going to like a charismatic group. And so I was a little vo vocal about my, you know, morality beliefs. And so, but we, but as far as performing her class and loving her, I'd still loved her and performing her class well, but we definitely didn't see eye to eye in a lot of stuff. And after uh, working with her for a while, she said, you have something on your life that I've never seen before, or I might've wow. only seen them one other time. I want to leverage my position with UCLA because she had been an alma mater there. That was her alma mater. And uh, she said, I want to leverage my position if you want to go to drama school to help you. Wow. And I remember just thinking out of all the students she's worked with for decades, she she's in her sixties. She chose me who didn't even have the same belief system for her. And I felt like God spoke to me at that moment saying, I'm going to open doors, even through people you would least expect. And so I was, I was on the perfect journey. I can tell you 25 of those times where God brought a natural circumstance, like that minor prophets in the old Testament and spoke to me about his nature, who I was, what he wanted to do through me. So that's where the prophetic really started. And then in wow. those, when he would speak to me about something about myself or about my life or about just my, I call it my prophetic journey. He would then also have me sacrifice or also speak to other people or like give away. So it was never self-absorbed. It was always like, let me lead wow. you in a journey with you, but also I want you to give back and give out. So there was always like a ministry arm to it as well, where all of a sudden I would, you know, have something else to say to somebody else. But I mean, he's always been that way. Like I've, you know, moved into houses that had prophetic significance and, and were, where he would, he would make it a message, not just a house, right? Have certain relationships open up and they were a message, not just a relationship. But again, I didn't, I didn't let them just be a message. I, I valued them for what they were, but also he would use it to be a, a story. That's amazing. I love hearing that, like these, these experiences. And you say you've had so many of them when you were younger, uh, outside of just a private personal time with God and how they would manifest in favor with people. And yeah. I think, I think people forget, I think there's a lot of people out there that have this desire to only encounter God in their personal private life but yet somehow disconnect that from its impact in their public life. Mm. And, you know, growing, like when I gave my life to Jesus, like my whole ministry started on the street yeah. in a marketplace scenario. I learned, I would say to everybody that I learned to hear the voice of God on the street, not in the church. I didn't, I wasn't yeah. attending prophetic classes. I didn't have, I didn't even have a grid. My first ever prophetic conference was a Graham Cook conference. I'd never heard of <laughs> Graham Cook and I just stumbled in there and it was the first time I'd ever heard prophetic teaching. And let me tell you, it was like wow. the greatest introduction ever because yeah. he's like one of the most amazing, solid, you know, individuals. And, and I just, I remember it like activating something even deeper in me, but I was learning it by just doing it. Cause I, I was under the impression that the power of God was only in the, as you go, these things will happen. So I was like going all the time and that's where I was encountering God the most. But then I learned this key of like that it made my private time even better because I would go and maybe something wouldn't happen or I'd get frustrated or I'd feel like, like, Oh, when I, like nothing happened the way I thought it was going to happen. Or I stepped out and, and then I'd go back into my private time and I'd wrestle this through. And then I started having encounters in both private and in public settings and it, that. it wrecked me and it, it became the foundation of everything that I am today. So I love hearing that. Like when you share stories, like, 
these encounters happening, they're not just encounters in your personal private life. They're in your everyday life. And I'm assuming your book, uh, encapsulates this right it's about but it does it's it's not a teaching book so it's really me telling about 13 or 14 of the main encounters i had back starting 2001 to about 2012 and <clears throat> excuse me and it's it tells i i would have never been able to do this other than god but i it puts them together to form perspective and also to give you faith for what god wants to do in, our, in this next generation so it's like a real faith-filled you're going to get connected to the heart of God, but I feel like my encounter becomes a reader's encounter, which I, when I say wow. that, it's almost That's cool. prideful sounding to say that, but it really, I feel like God's like, I gave you this encounter. So a lot of other people would have a prototype so they could experience me as well. So your encounter might become a starter encounter for some people, but I'm going to go on from there. Yeah. Because your testimony, I mean, it whets someone's appetite It'd be like, wow, there's, totally. there's more, there's more. And if he can access God in this way, I can too. The expression, the encounter will look different but it's an invitation to go deeper. You, you, in your excerpt on your book, the first part of it, I want to just explore this a little bit. It says in this book, Sean Bowles shares a series of rich divine encounters that have defined his spiritual perspective. So others can be released into new ways of thinking and experience an expansion of their spiritual intelligence. Explain that a little bit and share with us some of these encounters that did actually shape your perspective in a new way. Yeah. I mean, encounters are what launched me into going after the prophetic for substantive uh, prophetic experiences with world leaders and with the poorest of the poor and with people in the entertainment industry and with business leaders, because I had an encounter of what God was like, and he showed me what was possible. And a lot of it revolves around 2001. I mean, I, I never would have had this language without revelation, but I was, I was in a, caught in a vision and I saw, and I was just in my own time with God, but I saw this huge, city being built. And I didn't know what I was saying. It was an ancient city, but it was beautiful. Very, uh, it looked more Egyptian in a way than it did or Persian or something that it did Hebrew, just because of my mind, I wouldn't have understood Middle East architecture, but I'm watching this thing get built and it's going in fast forward, like time lapse. And I could see different parts of it, but the city infrastructure and the transportation systems and the school systems and the judicial system and just all the different, the greatest resources known to man are coming together. And I'm realizing, you know, a quarter of the way through that this is Solomon's time and that wow. he's building and he's in the middle with city planners and they're just dreaming of what it needs to look like because he'd been, excuse me, he'd been given the mind of God, you know, he'd been given the perceptions of God to build. And of course we think of the temple. Sometimes we think of the palace, but we don't think of the fact that every major leader from any known world power went to see him. His dad was at war with everybody. And in one generation, it turned into peace because of how he was building. And everybody went on spiritual tourism or even just judicial tourism to see how he reigned in his courts. It was so fascinating what he was doing. I mean, I, mean, I think of how many people have has Oprah had an audience with because people think she's wise. And I'm not saying she is or isn't. Right. But I mean, like how many millions of people have gone to try and have a live ticket with Oprah or with a religious leader or whoever, but people would come to Solomon's time because they wanted to hear how he was building and how the Hebrew God had given him a vision and strategy that was all encompassing. And as a matter of fact, the Jewish leaders later on didn't believe in Jesus because they were waiting for a Solomon. They were waiting for someone to build and then natural that brilliantly and to dispossess Rome and to take over Jerusalem in a real way and the whole thing. So they were confused when Jesus came and did it inside before outside because he came to set the inside world right before the outside world. But so it was just such an incredible thing to watch this and thinking about Solomon when he had the dream and God asked him, you can have whatever you want. And I'm watching this through a vision where he's saying, I want to think with your mind. I don't just want wisdom. I want your process, like your mind to overlap mine. And I want to build like that. And out of that, the most wealth and the greatest kingdom ever built was built. So crazy that people came from everywhere. And the amount of money, when you actually study out how much money it was worth, it was in the billions of dollars. There's yeah. no kingdom in history that had as much wealth documented as Solomon's did. So that's really unique too, because there's no, there's no other kingdom that actually listed yeah. the wealth of the kingdom that came even close. So as a matter of fact, it's 190 times bigger than any other kingdom in history. And just one, you know, one kingdom. So I think of that and I go, you know, I didn't know a lot of that topic because I got obsessed with it. You know, I wanted to study it, but I saw this and I felt like it was a prototype because God was showing me that in, as Jesus returns and the closer we get to his return, we're going to start to have the mind, 1 Corinthians 2, the last verses, we have the perceptions of Christ. What is it like to have the perceptions of Christ over children at risk in our generation or over yeah. environment yeah. or over farming and agriculture or over yeah. government? Yeah. And we have a deficit of that. We can see that in Canada. We can see that in America. We can see that in other parts of the world where there's a deficit of God and government. And yet God, the government that was 
given to Jesus on his shoulders is only increasing. So we should actually be really good government advisors. We not just yeah. with our own political agenda, good. but we should be able to bring in options that aren't on the table of current political parties. But because we're so more of the mind of this world versus the mind of Christ, a lot of times we don't get the solutions the world's crying out for, but God's bringing people like you and I, he's touching us, not just with his works, but with the perceptions, the intimacy of the fellowship of his mind, the way Jesus had when he was on the earth. And he prophesied this in John 14, 15, and 16, you have the Holy Spirit and you have the same operation of communion or relationship that I have with the father. Then he prayed for it in John 17. So when I'm seeing all this at once, and this is just the first chapter, it, it like, it, it totally changed my whole paradigm. And wow. I started to realize we're going to have access to revelation that's going to change world issues and is going to prove the goodness to God to a billion people who don't have power because wow. they're wow. going to get power from Christians who are in the yeah. you know engineer field, uh, power engineer field, or we're going to have people who don't have access to right water, or we're going to, you know, there's a Christian group who already, there was a, you know, a, a, the size of Texas, pile of plastic out in the ocean and they've already invented an invention and the environmentalist said it was going to take a hundred years to clean and they've cleaned it in a year and a half because the wow. invention God gave them. Wow. This has already happened. You can watch it on yeah. YouTube. It's documented. They don't talk about the Christian part of it, but they talk about how it's been cleaned in a year and a half. Well, I met with the people behind it and they're Christians and they had a dream and then God gave them the dream of how to do this. Love so it. we're solving world problems through revelation, not just like a word comes to you and you're like, okay, I will do it. But it's like God's mind and his desire to say Jesus deserves everything he paid a price for on the cross and everything the father prepared for him before he returns. We are part of that process to bring him the best of the best. And the father's not, not, not like withholding himself from us. He's giving himself through the Holy Spirit to us so we can really give Jesus all that he deserves. That's amazing. And if that hasn't sold anybody to buy the book, I don't know what will. That's, and that's chapter one. It's chapter really good. One. <laughs> What's chapter two? No, I, I, uh, I, just to comment on the Solomon thing. I love that. I love Solomon. I've always loved Solomon. And I love this, the way that you're connecting, having the mind of Christ versus, versus like the heart of Christ, you know, yeah. cause we, 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 when I teach on the voice of God, and I, I would assume you would teach the same thing. Like, you know, hearing the voice of God is really about hearing the heart and mind of God, Yeah. you know, and, but it, it, it can be expressed differently. And, and just for like, back to the Solomon thing for a second, like Solomon had the mind of Christ to know how to build, but then he had a, also the heart of Christ, so to speak, the heart of God, his Hebrew God, Yahweh, he had the heart of God to know why he was building mm -hmm. and what he was building. And so, and, and I, uh, studies that I've I've looked at for this, and I've always shared this, and I've taught on this. According to today's dollar, I don't know if this is U.S. or Canadian. If you were to put Solomon's Temple, just the temple component, into today's dollar, it would have been over fifty-four billion dollars. So yeah. it would have been like a fifty-four billion dollar church. <laughs> Imagine, well, with the inflation rate, it might be like more than twenty-five. <laughs> I'm just kidding. And if it's U.S., yeah. that's like a uh, hundred billion. <laughs> it's like hundred exactly. billion, but for Canadians, but not really. But anyways, the the point I'm trying to make is that when you have the heart and mind of God, and that you can see what God is is building, what you're gonna do is way different than what yeah. the world is doing. And we need this encounter. So I'm just gonna assume too, like for those that are listening. Because I think we throw the word encounter out so flippantly, right? I had this encounter with God. Well, to some people, like, what does that mean? Like, you had the peace of God. You felt the peace of God. You had, like, angels visited you, handed you a scroll with Hebrew, Hebrew on it, or, like, a lightning bolt struck you. Like, when you say the word encounter, what you're saying really is what I'm getting, even from your book, is, like, just getting the mind of Christ about a project, about a vision, or an invention, an innovation of any anything that's going to impact what you do you're likening that to an encounter with god is that correct yeah i mean it's kind of getting it downloaded his perceptions I my mean, you know you both uh, you both we both teach people um how to hear from god and what, what was interesting when i really started to teach people and i've taught tens of thousands of people if not probably actually millions of people now through all the media um but i've done tons of live events I and mean, we've toured all around the world it's some of the biggest churches in the world to teach by hearing god's voice the majority of people hear god's voice through their gut or their mind. They hear like thoughts get like projected thoughts or internal thoughts that come up because the Holy Spirit has the God who can't fit in his own time and space. He built lives somehow inside of us where his temple and he shares his thoughts and his heart, his inner heart with us. The first Corinthians two again says the Holy Spirit serves the deepest parts of God and relates it to us somehow inside. So a lot of Christians are tripping because they hear 
these incredible processes of somebody hearing God's voice audibly externally. And so that disqualifies if they're hearing a majority internally. Right. Yeah. And the most of the way we encounter God is through our internal process. And when you study neurology, it's really cool. Neurobiology is amazing. That's one of the reasons why I like the book because on the book, you have like the, the mind yet the tree of the tree of life. And it's a, it's a whole theme in the book is the oak trees or the trees of life. Um, but when you, when you study neurology, you realize that our mind has, I can't remember how many neurons our mind has like, I'm going to make this up, but like a billion neurons, our heart also has like 500 million neurons and our stomach has like 80 million neurons. I'm making that up. I can't remember the exact numbers, but that's about the ratio. <laughs> right. So we are neurology to how we think we think with our gut, we think with our heart and we think with our mind it's proven. Right. Yeah. And that means that the way we hear God, it's not just a heart process, but it yeah. involves the heart. It's not just in our gut or discernment, but it's also in the way we perceive the world and we perceive God around us. So I love that I was able to write into this because I start with how God created us before time began. Ephesians 2.10, it says that he thought of us, the destiny, the calling and the life we would have. And he prepared it before time began. So even before we were in our mother's womb, he knew us that thing. And I saw before time began, he was sitting over the firmament, you know, before he created humanity and he's looking at and he's dreaming of each one of us as a master artist dreams of their art as a parent dreams of their child but wow. for millions of years i mean the equivalent of millions of years went into each one of us and he, and there all these ro like rope cords were coming out of the father's heart and jesus and the holy spirit and the father were deliberating over each one laughing smiling intimately intricately creating and thinking and imagining and dreaming of us and it changed me because when you think of god that way and you think he's a creator and you think as a father, it's like, we have so much invested into us and there's so much of himself invested into us having a thriving, successful life. Jesus says, John 10, 10, you're going to live a life, a life abundantly. And it's like, there's so much of what the father and Jesus and the Holy Spirit dreamed of for us that we're living with such a small measure of it. And yet Jesus paid a price for the fullness of it. It just changed my whole life. I mean, it's just changed. ever since I had that encounter in 2004, wow. I've just been, I can't, I can't it, like... I can't get depressed. I mean, I can, I can have some depression, but I can't, I can't get into a darkness because I just look at his heart and go, there's so much more. There's so much more we have. And when you tie that together with the understanding the mind of God for your generation and for your calling, for your purpose, but then understand how in, intricately you were created and how beautifully you're loved even before you came to the earth. I mean, it's just phenomenal. Like wow. just to know what's available in his heart yeah. to us. That's amazing. And I think, yeah. So I think you kind of touched on it. I think for those that are listening, I mean, Every time you recognize the voice of God for yourself, you are encountering the yeah, living God. Absolutely. And I think that's hopefully that's like liberating for a lot of people because a lot of people that are outside of, let's say, the streams that really focus hyper on experience and encounter and you're listening to this and, you know, maybe you're in business and, you know, you, you think your perspective is like all the the pastors and the preachers out there, they're the ones that encounter God. And I'm like this yeah. marketplace guy. And like, you know, I do my daily devotions and I'm committed, but like, where's my encounter? I think there's this, um, we want to demystify this idea of what encounter is. Every time you get that nudge from God to, you know, meet that guy and build a network with that individual or, you know, step out into this new business idea or sign that contract or whatever it is for you, every time you're led by the spirit, it's as though you are encountering God in your every day. You may yes. not acknowledge it as an encounter because it doesn't stand out as anything abnormal, but that's what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be a normal every day being led by the spirit encounter with God. And I think if we can begin to acknowledge it, even in our language, I think it's almost like it's going to open us up more. To more well, I'm going to do an activation with the listeners at the end of where we're going to talk about that. So awesome. I'm excited you're bringing that up because it's literally leads us into that activation that we'll be doing because we have to learn how we're hearing God and when we're having our wins with our spiritual life so yeah. that we can look at that as a prototype for what's coming. And God always builds uh, foundation stone on foundation stone. So whatever he's done in the past is making us ready. And it's a prototype for what he'll do in the future. It's not the end point. It's not like, and even if you missed it, like when you know you missed something in God because you weren't obedient, the good thing is whatever God has in his heart will never leave unfulfilled in your life. So wow. it'll always come back around in a different way. So we could, he'll always recreate the fullness of destiny, not partial destiny, the fullness of destiny for us. That's why we see when people make maybe a bad mistake and they, and they end up in a road of divorce or they end up in a road of dis, disenfranchisement with one of their children, or they end up in a financial 
peril, like whatever. It's like God can still recreate your full life right. for full destiny. And that's, that's why we have to learn how to see that. So that even in times of weaknesses, when we're just being human and stupid, we do what we don't want to do, even though we know what we should do. It's like, we can still trust God when we turn to him, that he's going to recreate everything for us. And he'll encounter us to do that. That's amazing. And, you know, it's his promise that he is with us 24 seven. And so, you know, we as leaders need to be in our language pursuing God. What does an encounter with you look like today? What does an encounter feel like today? Like, yeah. how are you leading me today? Cause you said it in the beginning and I want to like kind of bring, bring this up again. You said something very powerful. You probably didn't know if you meant to say it, but it just came out. You said like, you wanted to not just have meaningful conversations. You wanted to have powerful conversations, Yeah, conversations that led to more powerful impact. I think this is why we need to be praying, God, I want to be someone in my leadership, in my business, in my career, in my vocation, with my coworkers, in my family, in my church, my ministry, whatever, that is encountering you consistently. Because I want to go from just meaningful interactions in my life yeah. to powerful interactions. And I think this is what your book really is about opening us up to, right? Like about going yeah, from I would meaningful say a, to powerful. It's a double punch, you know, combination because you have that. And you have the fact that we have to have an expectation for encounter because when you have an encounter with God, what would have taken 10 years will happen in a second or what, what would have taken a lifetime of education, a lifetime of career to accomplish will happen quickly. And there's so many things that God, the father's promised Jesus in order that Jesus would get his reward and his return. And those things are going to take us living an accelerated life. And it's going to take us living a double portion life. Like Elisha going to Elijah, I need double what you have. And so when you have an encounter, we're looking as a leader influencer, we're looking for God to add his value to us and do things that we couldn't do out of our own strength. Cause if you're yeah. a leader or if you're influenced, you can do a lot in your own strength. You can make a lot of things happen. I've talked to pastors after 10, 15 years of incredible success who have a breakdown and go, I did most of that myself. Wow. And they realized just through their own yeah. capacity of administration, engineering, whatever it is, that they had created that. So if pastors can feel that failed at the end, of, like with no dependency on God, no dependence on encounter, we can all go through that. And so the cool thing is yeah. when you start to look for how is my Christianity actually changing my opportunity? Am I getting everywhere I'm getting because I'm self-made? Or am I starting to see the parallels of where God's brought this opportunity, which led to this? And I would have had to go to school for seven years for that, or I would have had to, you know, be in excuse me, that industry smoozing or networking for 20 years. And I got the opportunities in three recognizing those moments of God of how he's building your life is part of the encounter. Sometimes you're encountering God by where you've gotten in life, not because he spoke to you directly, not because you uh, can even, you even knew that until afterwards where you look back and you go, I am here. And I should have only been here right. because I had said yes to God's process. Wow. And even recognizing how you've been encountered where you didn't know on a conscious level your, what your yes led you into, but realizing that God's added so much more value. than I mean, Christians, we have to have value that is added by God and the kingdom that we didn't bring. Right. That's the beauty of, the, of Christianity is that we're going to do things that we couldn't right. have done. Right. So we want, we want an encounter to be we have at the to forefront God. of everything. I mean, even, even Proverbs, Solomon said it in Proverbs three, in all your ways, acknowledge me and he'll make your path straight. Well, that word acknowledge is the word yada in the Hebrew. And it yeah. means literally to put him in experientially at the forefront of your journey. That's like it literally oh, to it. add him in. So I cool. want to experience you in all of my ways in all of my paths. And if I experience you in all of my ways, then I will walk straight and not crooked. And so, I mean, Solomon, we talked about Solomon, the wisest of all. Like who encountered God in a dream. God said, what do you want? What do you want from me? You know, I want to be able to administer justice. I want to be able to lead right and lead with sharp discernment and wisdom. And, and he had this encounter in a dream. And here he's saying these statements, like the book yeah. of Proverbs, so powerful about like putting him at as front and center as an encounter in your life. And if you do, you will walk straight. So I want to just acknowledge this one thing before we go into the activation a lot of people might be thinking in their mind, okay, like, you know, they've heard people share their encounters. That in word encounter is maybe scary to some people, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's flaky because no, but for real, like, you know, we're talking, hopefully we're demystifying it. Like you can encounter God's peace yeah. and you can encounter God. I feel led in my, just my, my knower. I just know I need to do this. And that's part of encountering God. But for so long, people have heard these crazy out there, 
what sounds flaky encounters by these maybe flaky people out there. And so a lot of people, they want to encounter God, but they've I've been never so heard turned that. off. Is that real? <laughs> <laughs> and so what, what would you say to them? Like, how do I get past my fears of this? Well, you know, it's the fruit idea check. of encountering You're God. You're measuring in encounters by fruit and not just like fruit, like does this have the Bible in it? I mean, that's of course, is it biblical is always important, but uh, it's always, you know, is this according to God's biblical nature is a good question to ask. But beyond that, that's pretty easy to ask because we moved to LA, I remember, and there was this weird prophetic group that used to be here and they were really well known. And we went to one of their meetings and the guy like gets up, I mean, it felt like a borderline personality or bipolar group who all found each other. And again, I have nothing oh wrong gosh. with mental illness or oh like, gosh. but when it, it was felt yeah. like a mental yeah. illness acting on the prophetic, not actually Got prophetic. It. That was done by broken people. I don't mind that at all. Like, but right. and he's like, I see a lot. Uh, no, Gabriel, the, the archangel of all of heaven, is in the meeting in this little meeting of eighty people, and his big toe is so big it fills most of the meeting. And we're supposed to go kiss the toe. So everyone's supposed to go and act it out. And like, and and if we kiss the toe, we're gonna have a heart for Israel. It's just he just did this whole weird. It was so bizarre, Sean. Like I, I still look back. We, I, I brought an internship with me to go there because we thought it was a legit group because they were like on lists online and processing a lot and whatever. I don't know where they went now, but wow. it was crazy. It was mental illness masked as prophecy. Wow. And, and, you know, if that's out there and there's, there's a lot of that kind of stuff that's out there. And again, there could be mental illness that has prophecy that I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people right. who can't yeah. recognize the difference between yeah. imagination or can't recognize the difference between um, conspiracy and yep. actual prophetic encounter. Yep. And the thing is, we should be able to measure it by its fruit. So when God speaks to you, you should be writing down whenever there's a fulfillment to it. And that's trained you for how to know how God speaks to you. Yep. So when God speaks to me, he speaks a lot about resources in my life and a lot about relationships in my life. So if I, if I hear God, like I remember, you know, I heard God about, I want you to sacrifice for people and hospitality and have people live with you for free. And so I had this man live with me he needed a place to go after his uh, marriage fell apart and he was going through a lot. And I had him live with me. I was like 19 or 20 years old and it worked out really good. And then I felt like God said, now I want you to bring these people that you met in Eastern Europe over and to go through your Bible school. I want you to pay their way to, cause I was in business at the same time as ministry, pay their way to go through um, Bible school for a year and let them come live with you, a young married couple. And that was a big step. And I was like, well, this worked out really good. And it brought restoration to his life. He's a completely new person. Why wouldn't God ask me for this? So I let them come over and I knew it was exactly 12 months. I wasn't going to violate that because if you go over, sometimes it turns right. into a mess yeah. and they came over and it was a lot of fruit, like so much fruit. And I loved wow. it. They're such great people. Wow. And then I met Hona, who, you know, one of my best friends yeah. in the world. And I met him right after they were leaving. I met him and I felt like God said, uh, bring Hona to, to Kansas city. And I lived in Kansas city at the time. And um, so I pay his way through all of Bible school and help him and pay his expenses and, and if you invest greatly into him, I'm already investing greatly into him. And you're going to inherit the fruit of the investment for the rest of your life. Wow. And I met him one day and I felt that big of a word, and but I had already him. killed the lion and the bear. Right. Yeah. So like when I asked wow. him to come live with me and asked him to go to, to a Bible school and stuff, I had, and I didn't necessarily even have chemistry with him at first. We didn't really click, you know, how you want to click with somebody. We didn't click. And, but, and he didn't speak very good English. And he just, he was 18. I was 23. I was like, he just felt like a little kid to me. And in some ways, and, and it's kind of like behind in some ways and, and socially, but he wasn't at all. It was just my perceptions at first. He was actually incredibly socially, but I didn't know that. So when he lived with me, it took four or five months to even bond to him, but he was doing good. And after about a year, he became one of my favorite people in my life. I, I tell people all the time, I have won the friendship lottery with Hona. There's wow. something so special. Everybody who meets him is like, he's so special. Hey, and I mean, that was 1996, I think, or seven, six. And he's been my best friend. That's 2022. Like we've done life together. His daughter babysits my kids, you know, like, like we've been in each other's lives now. So I just feel like you, well, and he you transitioned the those, church over to him that you, planted. Oh yeah. He, he leads my church. Like yeah, we're looking the, for leaders for the church. The and his wife. the long lasting yeah, fruit. I mean, like, totally. Awesome the legacy of where the church goes and the legacy of our men. We do so much in ministry together, but, but I think of Hona and I think of like, like, like I learned how to look for God in those areas. And there's been times it's been less sacrifice and greater sacrifice, but the way he taught me with those three situations has helped me to open up resources and help, help do things that I wouldn't normally do for people because God taught me. So I'm looking for the fruit, but sometimes I'll get on a prophetic tangent where there's not fruit, where like one time it was about an investment strategy that I thought was going to really work. And I saw this hole in this one government and I felt like this whole thing was going to happen with these bond markets and whatever. But I had to pray and go, have I ever done this before? No. Is this a huge investment? Yes. Do I think I have the prophetic credibility to myself 
to make this big of an investment. And I re realized, you know what? I don't, I don't have enough experience in this yet. So I asked a bunch of people who are really good Christians who are amazing. And it hurt my feelings because I all said I was stupid, but in a loving way said, this is not going to work. What you're getting is not God. You're probably hearing something, but this won't work. So I let this one play out because I felt it prophetically, but I didn't hear God to do it. I let it play out and I was wrong. So that was a good learning experience as well. So we have to learn from both the things that don't work out and the things that do work yeah, out. And great. we have to start to make a track record with those things that helps give us the faith for the future. Problem is most Christians don't think about the past. They only think about the present and the future. But right. the Israelites understood how you had to build from, uh, from one encounter to the next, one generation to the next, one story from the next to build your future. And that's hugely important. Wow, that's amazing. And I think in the end, if we're going to live a life of encounter, we can't be afraid of the wrong. Yeah, A lot of people absolutely. are so afraid of having the wrong encounter or being exposed to something that's false that they actually disconnect themselves entirely okay. from any encounter at all because they just live in this judgment of everything is bad, everything is wrong, everything is negative. And then we can't see the good when it does happen. And so yeah. I think we can't be afraid of the wrong and we have to have more faith in God's ability to keep us straight, to keep us walking forward than we do in the devil's ability to take us out and derail us. I think a lot of people have, more let me faith. say some of that real fast. Yeah. Cause then we have to end soon, but yeah. in the middle of pursuing a life of encounter is a lot of bad biblical eschatology. So a lot of people who have encounters, lay, it limits them from participating with what God's doing. So maybe it's technology. They've had encounters that, that like the whole generation hated the internet before they got on it as Christians. And they were like, the internet's evil. There's so much pornography on it. We shouldn't use it. You should limit your space. People were not having it in their houses. A lot of uh, whole movements of churches decided that the internet is bad. The problem with that is now we saw during coronavirus, the majority of churches had to go online even for their presence, become tele-evangelists, so to speak. We had to learn how to have virtual real estate. We had to learn how God wants to use the internet. And now it's like a third arm for almost all of us, even as Christians. It's one of the ways that we do life. But we, a lot of times because of the antichrist spirit that may come and possess a one world order, we, we, we prevent ourselves from entering into an encounter that God has for the now before the metaverse will be used completely only for evil, maybe one day. I don't know if that'll ever happen. That's a lot of people prophesy. There's a harvest to be had there. There's people who are living their whole lives through virtual reality and online. Sure. Yeah. And so there's a harvest to be had there. So God's going to commission yeah. some people to go there. And yeah. there's this thing, a lot of times with our encounters where we might see something about the end times, but we apply it to the now. And we think we're, because the world's in such a crazy place, we think we have to be overly cautious, cautious and in survival mode versus overcomer mode. So when you have an encounter, it should lead you and open you up to love more people. It shouldn't cause you to go into survival, maintain yourself at all costs, go into, you know, special bunkers. It should cause you to actually go, God's going to use something that I like Hollywood. I didn't even think you could use on this way. And yes, there's evil there, but there's also Jesus wants to be the greatest story ever told. And he's going to use Hollywood to do it in lots of different ways. So we have to have an open heart as we're having an encounter to not have that bad theology about the end times because that will destroy your encounter. I so agree. And I think that's so wise. Thank you so much for sharing that. What would you give us as an activation uh, for everyone out there right now to break through and move through? I mean, I know your book probably is an activation in and of itself. It's going to be an inspiring invitation to come into a new place of encounter. But what would you say practically whether it's the next seven days, 21 days, 62 days. Yeah, I would say the next, uh, I would say the next 30 days, look at your each week spent one time with God a week. And the first week I would say, look for three or four of the biggest wins you've ever had in your life and look for God in them. Like, wow. like define where was God in these moments? Did he help me to make these decisions? Did he lead me? Did he lead someone to me? And just look for the a pattern of those, those wins. Maybe it's in business or maybe you're a minister, it's a ministry. Maybe it's in your family or your relationships. Look for things that aren't according to your nature that you got to. You know, like, like look for where God's at. Then the second week I would look for right now, currently in life, what value is God adding in your life that you couldn't have had if you weren't a Christian? And ask that. That's a huge question. What has God put in, excuse me, what has God put in your life that wouldn't have been there if you didn't have him? And, and make a big list. Make as long of a list as you can. And if it's a short list, go get some mentoring and counseling. And I'm not saying that meanly, and it's not like you're disciplining yourself. You need help to articulate what God's doing in your life. And if you're, if you're shut down in that area, you need to focus on some attachment stuff. You need to focus on like, how do I reattach my faith to God? 
And so it should be a decent list. Like you should be able to write 10 to 20 things of wow. areas of value that God's adding to your life right now that you can see. And, it, and you're going to realize after you make that list, that is a very prophetic list because you're going to go, wow, financially we're here. I would have been here because I had an indebted nature, but I'm here. Or maybe it's relationally. You've given me these three groups of friends. I would have never met if it wasn't for going to this church and being involved with this project yeah. and being involved with and write those wins down. And then the third week, write down everything you're grateful for. Oh, then so next to what you're grateful for, look for God, like, like write it down, make the list first before you do it, write down everything you're grateful for. I hope it takes pages. Then spend the rest of the time you have in your devotional time that week, putting God's name for how you got there, wow. putting God's name for how it came in your life. The last week, I want you to make a list of things that you're believing that God will do that you can't do in yourself. You can't do based on your own opportunities, your own education, your own relational sphere, your own resources, your own social economic status. But what are some of the things that God wants to do that you know are beyond you and write them down and put as much detail on them to them as you can, and then close it up and say, I trust you, God. Wow. I love that. That is super powerful. Thank you so it's much. It's going to help a lot of people. I would encourage everyone to get on that and do that and make that a part of your next 30 days. I know that it will change your leadership. Sean, thank you so much. How do we get in touch with you? What's the best way to uh, connect with what you're doing? Well, we have an app that has all of our videos and podcasts on it. So that's fun. But we also, it's just the Bowls app, B-O-L-Z and it's free. But we have bowlsministries.com that has our online academy. You can go through classes and events with us. And of course, our podcasts are available everywhere podcasts are. And you can watch me on TV and every month on Praise, or uh, which is our main kind of course show, or our Exploring the Marketplace series on CBN News channel. It's on every Saturday and Sunday night at seven o'clock. Amazing. We'll put some of that stuff in the description below, and you guys can click that and get in touch with what Sean's doing. Thank you so much, Sean. Make sure Thanks to get me. Sean Bull's new book, Encounter. I know it will radically... <laughs> impact your journey sean i love you man i appreciate your time love you too and uh thank you to all the listeners out there once again this is the supernatural leadership podcast and remember every person out there has a leader within so let's make that leader a little more supernatural we'll see you next time